Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, and welcome to the In the Culture Worldwide Editions. I am Fa, and I am the co-host with with Mr. Tian here. He is the main researcher, and which is going to be the one who is who has actually created and has the plan to create this uh, this episode right here for you guys to watch and for you guys to talk to. So let's talk about a little bit about the project first. This is the special version of Viet Hip Hop's In The Culture podcast, a podcast created with the goal to promote and share valuable and informative knowledge regarding the hip hop culture to a wider range of Vietnamese audience in an academic manner. The podcast is a part of a big project, that being the fundraising for the publications of tentatively my work uh, called Street Lecturers and Introductory to hip hop studies uh, within the book, um, Vietnamese hip hop enthusiasts can find translated versions of multiple different academic sources, most likely coming out from uh, um, academic books and uh, essays uh, talking about hip hop cultures in general, as well as within the four core elements of hip hop: graffiti, emceeing. Teaching, breakdancing, and also the fifth element, knowledge. That's what we're doing right here. The project is completely nonprofit, as as we will produce this book via crowdfunding. So your contributions matters to us a lot. And for each uh, level of donation, we will send a copy of the book to the person who has donated, along with other special benefits. One of which is that we're going to donate. Uh, a copy of Street Lecturers to a university library in Vietnam, and we're trying our best to engage and extend the pay it forward um, philanthropic um, manners to the wider audiences in Vietnam. And also, we're going to fulfill the desire. We'll feel like this is a perfect time to expand the culture to another format, in this case, via this webinar. Yeah. As the project is solely concentrated on provide in providing academic information, we need to give a very big disclaimer that there will be multiple points of views that may not be aligned with the typical POVs. All of the information delivered within the, in the culture should only be viewed as referencing resources, and viewer discretion is advised heavily. In the Culture Worldwide Edition will consist of multiple different webinars. Each of them will focus on uh, different elements of the hip hop culture to bring to the table a diverse range of information as well as experiences from many renowned scholars and researchers. All of the information provided in these webinars are also going to be included inside the book of Mr. Tien's right here with all translated clearly. And, uh, with that in mind, Mr. Tian is going to talk to you and introduce to you guys about our guest speakers today, Dr. John Lennon. So, yes, please. thank you, Fao. We are very delighted to have a special guest today, Professor John Lennon from um, University of South Florida. Now I'm just going to briefly introduce him with most a lot of his achievements. So please allow me to do so. Uh, Professor John Lennon is a professor of English and director of graduate study at the University of South Florida. His research interests and publications vary with topics from working class literature to street art and graffiti. No matter what he is publishing on, though, there is usually one thread that connects them all. His work is principally concerned with how marginalized individuals exert a politicized voice in collectivized actions. Such publications are Boxcar Politics, The Hobo in Literature and Culture from 1869 to 1955, published by the University of Massachusetts, and the edited two volumes of Working Class Literatures, Historical and International Perspectives, Volume 1 and 2, published by Stockholm University Press. Professor John Lennon's newest book, Conflict, Graffiti, From Revolution to Gentrification, published by University of Chicago, Chicago Press in 2022, explores the many 
permutations of graffiti in conflict zones, ranging from the protest graffiti of Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson and Tahir Square demonstration in Egypt to the tourist attraction murals on the Israeli separation wall and a street art that has rebranded Detroit Post and Post Katrina New Orleans. An excerpt of his book, For More Than Profit, Graffiti Street Art and the Gentrification of Detroit, which explore the effect of gentrification on historically Black communities and people's lives has been translated and will hopefully be produced and published in the first Vietnamese translated hip hop studies readers in next year, 2024. Yeah, so give a round of applause for Mr. John Lennon. Please hey. welcome John Lennon. Uh, doctor, please uh, give a bit of introduction as well as say hi to all our audiences and spectators, please. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate this. I'm excited to, uh, to speak to you all and let's talk graffiti. <laughs> yeah, all right. So uh, we actually have a, a bit of a question that we should, we're going to use for the ice breaking part of this. So just people get a hang of all our pacing as well and get to know you more a little bit. So the first and pretty much a very obvious question is we would like to ask what is the main reason that attracted you to do all the research about hip hop in general and graffiti in specific? What was your starting point? What engaged you to dive into this culture? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So everything I do, I'm really interested in, in putting class in the center of it. So whether I'm looking at hobos, which were this um, kind of itinerant population of homeless people in the late 19th and early 20th century in the US, I'm interested in how they as a poor or working class folk were able to kind of collectivize and 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 exert kind of political opinions. But mm. with graffiti, it's the same thing. What if we actually don't just look at graffiti from a style or aesthetic point of view, but actually look at it from a class point of view? Mm. What happens? So I know you're writing um, an edited collection, which is really, really amazing that you're you're both doing this and Tian that you're doing this is really uh, awesome. Um, but let's take hip hop, for example. Uh, hip hop grew up Right. One, one of the histories of hip hop is that it grew up from poor black neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods. It was a voice of the people of that neighborhood. What happens to that hip hop when it gets commercialized and now is being sung by white middle class, upper class people who are singing about black poverty without actually thinking about the black poverty? So class is always really interesting to me. Same thing with specifically with graffiti. If you take graffiti, which again was a poor working class from the neighborhoods on the streets, you look at class in that way, and then all of a sudden now you take a Banksy, you take rich folks who are buying for millions of dollars street art and talking about graffiti. What happens when we to the actual practice itself when we put class at the center. So that's really how I kind of see this connection between everything. And I'll try not to talk with my hands as much because I can see it going right in front of my face. So I'll try to stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, very fascinating. Thank you, Mr. General Lennon. And sure. actually that flows perfectly into our, our next question because we do know that you're an author of several implications and one of which was the working class literature Historical and International Perspectives, Volume 1 and 2, as well as the chapter about the book about the graffiti and conflict that you have written. So out there, do you find out any similarities between the working class literature and graffiti? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Again, like I was saying, like class at the center of my analysis is there. So for the chapter that hopefully will be in, in the um, in the edited collection, class is exactly important. So one of the things that I talk about, right, is you have a uh, um, a block in Detroit, uh, a very poor kind of uh, absolutely black neighborhood that a white entrepreneur comes in and wants to use graffiti as a way to sell the neighborhood. Now he hired a black, uh, graffiti writer, someone who's 
been in the scene for years and years and years. And what happened is it was a little bit working for a while. Graffiti was all around the neighborhood. It was bringing in people. The, the entrepreneur was bringing in people to look at the graffiti. It seemed good, but that racial class dynamics all of a sudden exploded. And so what I write about in the chapter is really that interrelationship between, you know, when you have outsiders coming into black and white outsiders coming into black neighborhoods to try to sell those neighborhoods to other people who can afford it, usually other white folks, that how does that change the neighborhood? And what I specifically look at is how graffiti and street art actually play a really important role in that. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Dr. John Lennon, because that, that is actually a very fascinating point of view. And we, we're, we're, hopeful, we're hoping that in your next publications and a lot of your other next up and coming works, we hope to find out more about your perspectives about that, taking regard of that problem as well. And one last question for all of these uh, uh, making, uh, making uh, familiars to each other. Uh, we do know that your name is a very, very special name. And do you find that that name, the John Lennon name, actually gave you some kind of instinct about music in general and as well as the art within you? Do you find that actually there's some resemblance? So I played in one, one time I played in a punk band in which wow. I played the shovel. I played a shovel. Basically, I just banged on a shovel. Sadly, yeah. that is the extent of my musical ability. I have absolutely no musical ability whatsoever. I was named after my dad, not the Beatles. So, um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no skills that way. I wish. I would not be an academic. I would be an abandoned if, if I could. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Well, uh, after this, uh, after this webinar, we are very much looking forward for you to send us your your songs with your band. So if <laughs> if there is, so yeah, yeah. Let, we are looking forward to that. But without further ado, I think that the question about graffiti as well as conflict is going to be set up perfectly for your presentation today. So please, we will give back the stage to Dr. John Lennon to give his work of presentation. In the culture. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, I first want to thank Tian and Fa for inviting me to this talk. It's the first time I have participated in a, which will be a live translation, although it's a little bit not as live right now, but uh, there will be yeah. uh, a translation. So I really appreciate that. I'm also from Queens, New York. So I talk fast. And I'm often very hard to understand. So my apologies if I mess up and I'll purposely try to speak slower. Um, I'm also really, really excited to be included in this edited hip hop collection. And it's really a big honor for me. So thank you, thank you for that. Today, I wanna lay out the general argument I make in my book, Conflict Graffiti from Revolution to Gentrification. And then I'll do a deep dive on a specific example recent protests against racist police brutality in Ferguson, Missouri, a state in the central part of the US to illustrate my main arguments of my book. But first, a backstory. I grew up in Queens, New York at the tail end of what they call the era of the trains. Graffiti was a big part of my life. And while my dad hated graffiti, and defended our home against taggers. I was sneaking into Manhattan with graffiti writers and seeing the city from a completely different perspective. So for me, graffiti has always been this battle between erasure and production. The desire of people like my dad, who saw graffiti as a tack on his way of life, and from taggers where writing was a way of life. But then in 2011, I was living in Florida and I saw online the Tahir Square protests and the massive numbers of people taking over the square. I also saw the graffiti on the walls. And it was a different type of graffiti than I grew up with. As I was watching this, a question formed that I could not shake. When police snipers are firing down from rooftops, 
and the blood of friends is spilling onto the streets, why would someone stop and write graffiti? I traveled to Lebanon, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Germany, and Sweden to meet with graffiti writers and activists to find out. And traveling to countries and spending time in each one of them, there was some general waves of graffiti that happens in conflict areas that I started to notice. So I have three main waves of graffiti. I'm just going to very briefly go through each wave. So the first wave, violent conflicts often seem to erupt out of nowhere. During the first wave of graffiti, graffiti often anticipates and or announces this beginning graffiti, uh, this beginning conflict. The signs are literally the writing on the wall expressing citizens' political desires. In some conflicts, the marks are few and quickly erased. In the recent protests in Iran, for example, quick graffiti shows a resistance to the state. In this example, for um, uh, it was a, a sign commemorating martyrs in the um, Iran-Iraq war, but someone wrote over it with the newest protest, uh, uh, with new protest names. Before the Bronx burned in the summer of 1977, graffiti could be found throughout the poor sections of the city with tags vying for space on the city's public housing. As either a whisper as in Iran or a roar as in the Bronx, graffiti is often present in an area before violence and protests erupt, anticipating calls for action. And that's uh, an example of the type of graffiti that was happening in New York City at the time. The second wave. As the conflict turns to avert violence, a larger second wave of graffiti appears in conjunction with protesters on the street. From Cairo's tear gas streets to the Katrina flooded streets of New Orleans, I'm interested in why and how community members use graffiti to magnify their voices in the conflict's chaotic violence. These voices speak in numerous dialects, aesthetic forms, and political positionings. It is this wave of graffiti that is most recognized, even if it's in mere background, because this is what the media's focus is during the conflict. Third wave. The third wave of conflict of conflict graffiti transpires after the physical violence has subsided and the area lurches into a tenuous post-conflict situation. Here graffiti often transforms again, moving non-linearly from a voice of minority protest to one of majority suppression. Graffiti aesthetics, which in the first two waves often call attention to blatant inequalities in the community, slowly change. Shorn of uncomfortable politics, beautiful images dot the neighborhood, embodying generic universal themes rather than advocating against specific injuries. In some societies devastated by conflicts, entrepreneurs seeing profit in a neighborhood in flux uh, uh, sorry, often use graffiti to sell a new post-conflict area to the highest bidder. A key point, though, is these waves are never perfectly formed or clearly demarcated. Dependent on political tides and environmental forces, they crash down upon a particular area, mixing together in giant, messy pools of competing ideological desire. For example, the speed with which a multinational corporations use revolutionary graffiti lettering to sell expensive cars to Egyptians shortly after the Tahir Square demonstrations was both shocking and significant. As Amar Abu Bakr and other revolutionaries were painting anti-government slogans and murals of dead protesters on the walls of Mohammed Mahmoud Street, Bia Chrysler adopted the graffiti style to sell the dream of a post barbaric society in ads throughout Cairo that showcased the personal quote unquote freedom 
a Jeep Cherokee could bring an individual. Essentially, competing graffiti waves interact and mix together. Some waves are overpowered and break apart, others form large, messy swells. No matter the wave, though, graffiti are often encountered as fetishized aesthetic objects. On Instagram, Twitter, or now X, Flickr, and other social media sites, millions of disembodied images of graffiti are posted. Where the individual pieces of graffiti originally appeared, the street, the neighborhood, the city, the country, is often undiscernible. Graffiti, though, are historically framed physical phenomenon. On walls during a conflict, they physically interject themselves into larger political environment. They enact a performance of resistance, defying a dominant narrative of ubiquitous state power. Graffiti is one tool of resistance among many that reveal the cracks in state power by writing over it. To understand graffiti's subversive performative power is to explore the state's performance of its own power through the built environment. These dueling performances are locked in a dialectic struggle. To appreciate the former, one must recognize the latter. Okay, let me give a specific example and I'll walk you through uh, one specific example to kind of show how these waves are, are always present and contradicting each other or fighting against each other. So these waves form the backbone of my book and I use case studies to illustrate them. Today, I will focus on Ferguson, Missouri in the aftermath of Michael Brown's death, a black man killed by a white police officer. The graffiti found on these walls is one example of the various and often contradictory graffiti waves that exist within a particular conflict. After a white police officer killed Michael Brown, graffiti played an active role in contextualizing the ensuing protests while framing police violence as both a national and international problem. As the protests died down though, graffiti became a tool to depoliticize the uprising, remaking a movement against racialized police violence into universalist and non-confrontational messages of peace. So here's the story. On August 9th, 2014, Officer Darren Wilson stopped Michael Brown, who is walking in the middle of a street in Ferguson, Missouri. In conflicting claims, Brown's hands were either raised in the sky or used to lunge at the police officer. Either way, the unarmed 18-year-old was shot six times and died in the middle of the day on the same street where he was stopped. When news of his suspicious death emerged, the streets of Ferguson erupted in civil unrest. One night after the shooting, a local quick trip gas station burned down, 12 stores were vandalized, and numerous people were arrested. A small town 20 miles from St. Louis had suddenly became the focus of international news. The unrest, unrest lasted for weeks, with the violence live streamed by protesters and displaced on all of the major news channels. As Brown's blood stained the asphalt, thousands of protesters in Ferguson and throughout the country symbolically embodied the young man. Standing sometimes inches from police wearing riot gear, they mirrored Brown's alleged last position, chanting, hands up, don't shoot. For many of these protesters, Brown's death was a bloody representation of the systematic racism that black and brown people face daily. As protesters were overtaking the street, graffiti was also overtaking the walls. In Ferguson, graffiti was a dynamic tool in this resistance, inhabiting both a physical and a virtual life. Reading this graffiti helps reframe the inherent chaos, contextualizing and teasing out nuances of reaction to the unrest. In the days after Michael Brown's death, graffiti offer, offered a variety of overt political messages. Some were simplistic. Brown's name written in shaky lines. Others were more ornate, 
Brown's image surrounded by RIP or hands up. As the above examples indicate, uh, as those examples indicate, graffiti are not monolithic statements. Just as protesters er uttered a wide range of political expressions, so did the graffiti. Spraying blanket statements about the police, ACAB, which stands for All Cops Are Bastards, is not the same thing as spraying Brown's image on the wall. Too often when graffiti is spotted in conflict areas, all messages are categorized under one generic ideological banner of protest, which denies the nuances of political thought of those who are actively engaged. To illustrate this point, the following examples show how Ferguson graffiti specifically frames Michael Brown's death within a larger history of police violence, but in dramatically different ways. The first graffito is of nine places and dates written in marker on the side of a quick trip gas station uh, pump destroyed in the protest. This graffiti rhetorically connects Ferguson protesters with protesters from different continents over the past 70 years. Contextualizing a history of state-imposed violence, this graffiti places this Missouri town within a global fight for marginalized people. Importantly, it is not specifically about race or police violence specifically. Rather, it internationalizes Brown's death through instances of localized state violence. This linkage found purchase in other protests throughout the world that used Brown's death and the large media presence covering it to symbolically connect to their own protest movements. Graffiti sutured together these separate geographic areas and complex, varied political situations, awkwardly linking the local, the national, and the international conversation in Ferguson. This graffiti on a gas pump itself, a gas pump itself is an international symbol of embedded state violence of extraction, refuses to spotlight Ferguson as an isolated incident, instead for forcing a broadening of the historical angle. The second graffiti that I analyze here is most often uh, cropped out from one of the most viral photographs to emerge in Ferguson protests. And this is, this is the one that kind of went on all the media channels, this, this image right here. In this photograph, the camera is behind and to the side of a black man with a backward hat covering his long hair. Wearing blue shirt and jeans, a backpack hanging off of one shoulder, his hands are raised as he stares down a very frightening dystopian reality. Men in green fatigues, combat boots, armor vests, knee pads, gas masks, and helmets are pointing automatic weapons directly at him. While this image might be common in many countries throughout the world, in the U.S. it is out of place. This officer is not part of an army in a foreign land. He is a member of the U.S. police force patrolling the streets of a Midwestern town with militarized weaponry. This photo is of a great many contrasts, the casual attire of the black man with his hands up against a heavily armored white man in camouflage, weapons drawn. For many, this photo is a visual representation of the violent policing of black and brown bodies in the US. If we expand the frame to see the full original photo, however, we can spot graffiti that speaks to this larger political struggle against racialized violence in the hands of the police. Scott Olson took this photo on Wednesday, August 13, 2014, Olson was heading toward the Michael Brown Memorial when he heard an explosion and photographed this encounter while running from the police charge. In his photo, a metal fence on one side and a blue U.S. Post Office mailbox is on the other side. They frame this image. On the mailbox is a hastily drawn graffiti message, fuck the police. This graffiti is simultaneously a full-throated threat and a contextualization of the Ferguson protests. 
In reaction to the 1965 Watts uprising, which is in Los Angeles, Marvin X uh, wrote a poem called Burn, Baby, Burn, with the line, Motherfuck the Police, to describe police interactions with blacks within a history of enslavement. And the phrase, fuck the police, has since become to describe violent, racialized policing. The phrase draws the divide between the two sides in clear, intentional language. In the 1980s, the phrase became popular and more widespread with the 1988 release of NWA's album Straight Outta Compton. Ice Cube, who was born four years after the Watts Rising and co-wrote the song Fuck the Police with MC Ren, stated that the song emerged from living a life in an impoverished area where there is an ideological divide between the black community and the police. Ice Cube argues that the song allowed black people to invoke the phrase together in public. In fact, at a Detroit concert, the crowd chanted the phrase repeatedly until NWA began to rap it. And then they were quickly shut down by the police, although no charges were filed. From NWA's song to Public Enemies 911 is a joke to Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, where the film's main character, Radio Rahim, is choked to death by a white police officer, is actually based on the killing of a graffiti writer. Black media revealed the systematic racism of policing in the U.S. Fuck the police does not refer to one particular racist act by the police. It is an overall reaction to the divide between the police and the black community. If we return back to Scott Olson's photo from Ferguson of a black man facing a large number of militarized police officers, the graffiti, uh, the graffiti fuck the police, hastily drawn on the mailbox sometime before the action in the photo, but commenting on the event as it is occurring, is both a political statement and a lesson in the urban history of police violence. On the mailbox, the graffiti pulled no punches, the intensity of his vulgarity matched that of the violence enacted in the streets. The NWA song describes Los Angeles as, quote, a war zone, and the militarization of Los Angeles prefigured that of Ferguson by 25 years. So from the mouth of a young ice cube in 1988 to a graffiti on the side of a Missouri mailbox in 2014, the phrase both historicizes and resists how the state surveils and polices black bodies using militarized weaponry to control the population. In the days and weeks after Michael Brown's death, these types of graffiti materialized throughout Ferguson. When they were erased with white swaths of paint, others emerged in their place. The copious graffiti made during the Ferguson protests were born of the city and of Brown's death. The graffiti, though, were linked to previous uprisings. The roots of conflict graffiti are not direct. They often emerge in the collective consciousness. During the Ferguson protests, when men and women took to the streets to confront the police, they walked in the footsteps of earlier civil rights protesters. Even if they had never participated in the protest before, their political desire compelled them to join with and follow others. It is the same for graffiti. Those who write graffiti after Brown's death might never have held a spray can in their hands before, but their political desire led them to join with and follow others in the swell of protests. The messiness of political graffiti becomes evident as we examine graffiti's longer life on Ferguson walls and a new graffiti wave that becomes apparent. Weeks after Brown's death, the street protests dwindled in numbers and were contained, controlled, and dispersed by the police. People returned to their normal everyday lives. Most of their overtly anti-police graffiti were erased from the walls. The graffiti, though, did not completely disappear. And some of it has been published in Deborah uh, Gambill's and Ronald Montgomery's book called Let's Heal St. Louis, 
Ferguson, Missouri in Poetry and Paint that was uh, published in 2015. Interspersing images of poetry by Gambille and Montgomery, the book illustrates Ferguson's restoration through graffiti. In their introduction, the poets explain that a small advertisement in a local newspaper asked for community members uh, to join together to write messages and draw pictures on the boarded up windows of the business district damaged during the, the unrest. Graffiti images of doves, flowers, peace signs, and the word love dominate the uh, collection. Significantly, there's also a photo of a cartoonish image painted by with big hands and feet framed by the words, hands up, let's pray. That's one. The image coincided with a social media presence, including Facebook and Twitter profiles and the hand, uh, hashtag, hashtag hands up, let's pray. That according to his Twitter uh, account, is, quote, a global movement with the purpose of uniting God's people, one church, one community, and one nation at a time, end quote. Now, putting aside what appears to be the very good intentions of the poets and the community members, both young and old, who painted on the walls, it is important to understand how this wave of graffiti interacts with the previous waves. As the city began to restore order, the universalizing message began in earnest. Instead of fuck the police, page after page of images in the book are universal platitudes, such as, quote, be good to each other, or, quote, peace for Ferguson, or, quote, we are one, or, quote, even in the darkest of nights there is hope. In these sprayed messages, there is no guilty party or systematic racism. Instead, the message reflect an individual responsibility to be good. These graffiti reframe the conflict, neutralizing any pointed political attacks. Speaking as a community as one, instead of identifying the real deep divisions between black and white, rich and poor, police and protesters, paints over the wounds laid bare in Brown's death and restores a racial status quo. This reframing of protest surfaces in the politically tone deaf, quote, hands up, less pray, and this was all over the place, photo reprinted in the book. Michael Brown's alleged last position taken in his life was with his hands up. He was still shot six times, twice in the head, and four times in the right arm. Hands up, let's pray, erases the specific action that Brown used to protect himself and the material conditions that young black men face every day in the United States. Instead, the message promotes protection from a mystical higher power, which is curiously enough depicted as a white male figure. The inclusion of a few graffitied All Lives Matter throughout the book underscores the racialized framework that pushes back against the B Black Lives Matter movement, turning attention away from black people being killed by police to generic universalizing all lives. Overall, the graffiti healing of Ferguson in the third wave presents, um, I'm sorry, overall, the graffiti healing of Ferguson in this third wave presents uh, a self-evidently an economic one, as evidenced in, evidenced in the image of a white dove with an open sign in its mouth on a boarded up glass door of a local business. I'll close here, um, but I'll end right at this point. Hip hop is a way for oppressed minority voices to exert their voice. voice. But like hip hop, graffiti can be monetized and undermined and turned into a force to re-exert dominant capitalist forces over the needs and voices of minorities. When we look at graffiti, as we all love to do, we must be conscious of the political readings that is entwined 
with our aesthetic readings. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. John Lennon, for your very informative as well as detailed and very passionate presentation. In the culture. There is a lot of things that we would like to ask because, wow, that was a lot of information. And for me personally, we, we do, for us personally, we learn actually way more than we actually intended to and we expected to because yes. um i i was very intrigued by the by the last waves of the graffiti because at that moment i think that is when everything is kind of loses its core essence in the graffiti kind of way yeah and uh uh throughout the when when you were giving your presentation as well as do we we, we do a lot of uh other activities with to promote this uh conversation so there is actually a few questions we have been gathered in uh, in uh, throughout the days and we would like to ask it and uh, transition this part of the presentation into the q a session right now yes great yeah so uh one question i guess now is we're going to talk about like you said it's the way graffiti has been changing throughout the three waves and within your opinions, uh, what would you think the relationship within this triangular relationship between graffiti, um, like previously you can say also kind of like a matter that we're thinking of tourism mm -hmm. and uh, the authenticity of hip hop culture or specifically graffiti? Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, how is graffiti kind of subsumed into a more commercial um, entity, right? So yeah. I, I think the easier, and, and how tourism actually plays out with all this. It's a great question. And um, I'm, I'm currently writing a new book, uh, and I spent some time in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, yeah. And, you know, Belfast, Northern Ireland is a, is a divided city between Catholic and Protestant, between loyalists and Republicans, and it, it has stayed that way. So what I want to do is examine, and it, you know, during the 30 years or more of what they call the Troubles, which was these just, you know, violence for 30 years within the streets, bombings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're now in this post-conflict time, right? So when I went there, I was expecting it to be very much um, just a, a different type of city than what I expect, expected. The divisions are absolutely still there. And I want to explore those divisions. I'm doing that through looking at tourism and graffiti. So I'm looking at two specific neighborhoods. In one of those neighborhoods, um, it's really the, the working class neighborhoods. And if you're, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there's a wall, they have walls dividing the working class communities, the Protestant and Catholic communities. And on these walls, you have political muralism. Um, depending on which neighborhood, it might be pro-Republican uh, or it might be pro-Unionist uh, or um, uh, London-based, UK-based. Um, and so you have these murals that have been there for 40 years, constantly being re-updated, still kind of there. Then you have in the downtown area, you have a gentrifying neighborhood where there is not those necessarily ethno-nationalist divisions, but now these class divisions are coming up because they're gentrifying that whole city. The reason why I'm bringing this up, in the West Belfast or in working class neighborhoods with the political muralism, there is a tourist trade that goes there. You walk there, there's these black taxis, there's people who are constantly, I mean, money is always being there where hundreds and hundreds of people per day are being brought through the streets to look at these political muralisms. The same thing though is happening in the gentrified areas where street art, which is non-political, which is, you know, really good stuff, but it's like funny birds, people with, you know, hats on, it's, it's just non-political. That also is being uh, a tourist trade with tours being shown that this is going to be the new Belfast. So you have two very distinct areas, a uh, 
uh, a working class population that is continuing to hold on to those ethno nationalist divisions, but are selling them to tourists uh, who are coming through their neighborhoods. And then you have another section where it's we don't want to talk about any of the trauma that happened. We're just really looking at, you know, present. We're just trying to make a new city that is going to ignore the past. That's simplistic, but that's kind of the way, you know, those two divisions are. Then, so, but, and you have tourism in both areas. So it is connected in that way. I'll end here. The only difference is that there is really this really awesome, just straight out bombing graffiti crews that are in Belfast as well. And there is one, uh, somebody is using the tag FAP and they go throughout Belfast. FAP stands for fuck all paramilitaries. So mm. it's actually going into very dangerous areas if you are, you know, writing that and they're putting that through as a political statement. So you have these two tourisms, then you have a graffiti writer who's, who's going through there. It's a really interesting city. So to answer your question, Tian, it's it's that's kind of what I'm looking at, how tourism is actually being connected to very different types of graffiti and street art scenes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I'll add a quick point to that for anyone's and especially Vietnam who aren't familiarized with Belfast. There's an academic award winning movie by Kenneth Brennan who's talking, I think, directly about the the time that was the struggles between the working class and especially like the way um, um, Dame Julie Dench uh, at the end of that movie is just looking straightward to the uh, camera and just say go to the young boy and the family who's, I think, fle migrating outside of Belfast during that time. And I think it's brought very personal message uh, of Kenneth Branagh, the director, who's also winning the orig uh, original uh, screenplay Oscar Awards. Uh, um, memories and childhood growing up there and moving out of that city. So if you guys want to know more about the history and also waiting for Professor John Lennon's book, about that part well check check out the movie first <laughs> see the movie the movie is interesting so absolutely and that is for sure like right during the middle of uh beginning of those troubles that's absolutely what it was about yeah yeah okay so thanks to this presentation i got a new movie in my bucket list so <laughs> Thank you very much yeah. for that yes waiting adding up everything every day <laughs> yeah okay go. so when i think of graffiti and through all the mass media, there's a lot of people certainly will think about Bansky. And Bansky is a very, very interesting case study regarding graffiti. So you know, what do you think about, what is your opinion on Bansky? And do you feel like, uh, what waves do you feel like Bansky's work of art uh, belongs to in the three waves that you have mentioned? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and honestly, you can't, talk about graffiti and street art without talking about Banksy. So when I wrote Conflict Graffiti, I wasn't planning on writing about Banksy, and yet he is important in about three of my chapters, because he's yes. always, always present, right? I mean, from a very one way, um, I would think of this. Banksy made street art street art. So while there were other people who were getting famous and they were kind of, there's, you know, they were they were hitting the mainstream, it was Banksy's images and the way that he was able to promote himself what to make him an international star. And that has absolutely changed what the graffiti street art scene has been. Once Banksy hit big, many people went out to the streets and tried to copy him. And there's just so many imitators of Banksy throughout the street. Now, a lot of those are, again, middle class kids who have some time and are not willing to, like, you know, graffiti bombers every night hit the streets. They kind of put up a cool poster and take a picture of it and upload it onto Instagram and they become famous. So, like, that's kind of the way that Banksy's motion move did. It's not hitting as many places. It's hitting one strategic location and then uploading it onto its website or Instagram or Twitter and getting fame that way. So for that reason alone, Banksy changed, I think, everything. Again, because he was able to uh, strategically hit something and then promote it. Example, 
the Israeli um, uh, um, separation wall by putting his graffiti on a few spots of that and then putting it in Instagram, but also his book, that kind of made everyone start thinking, oh, wow, you can do these in really wild, dangerous, interesting areas, right? So I write about that kind of experience. But in New Orleans, for example, in the US as well, he did it right after Katrina and he put it up and then he kind of was able to connect his art with a larger political question of what happened in with Katrina and the lack of resources are there. So the main point here, and I won't go long, but the main point of his work is I actually come more towards him. I do like his work in terms of his political movements, but it's always connecting a political, uh, uh, his art to a strategic location that is politically um, uh, wild, a politically like uh, a dangerous area, he puts his art there and then he gets fame to that. So he's a perfect brander. He's a perfect um, way to think about how to connect his art, politics, and the media all together. So he is, he is an amazing figure in that way, whether you like him or not, just the way he is able to get his brand out is really fascinating. Yeah. Thank That's, you. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, answer. And that is when I realized that because my friend tell me, told me he was his name was Mengski, but actually his name was Mengsi. So yeah, God, we have the new new things to learn every day. So thank you for that. And that was actually very informative because yeah, oh, uh, a lot of people actually thought that, and they they only I met a lot of people that they would only think about Mengsi as the one who commercializes everything, but. And from now on, I don't, we do actually think that we have to restate that opinion because yeah. Macy actually is a, very, a prime example of perfectly timing and perfectly planned precisions, actually. Yeah, and I think the way we can say it, he's quite strategically putting his name out of the world. I think that's the whole personal branding, if you can say, in kind of like marketing term, right? But in that sense, he embedded his political messages into that. So it's both is a win-win situation. It is a win-win situation I mean, for him and for the community that's who is like bearing under those conflicts as well. And he's doing no different than the political, uh, than the, you know, stylistic street writers, you know, uh, in 1970s New York. But it, the, the difference is the media, right? So. Fame has always been part of the graffiti world, right? So it is about hitting, you know, 1970s, 1980s, New York, hitting your name as many um, buildings as you can. Taki 183, who was like one of the very first kind of famous in the New York scene, he was a messenger. So his job allowed him to go throughout the whole city and he would just tag his name wherever he had to go. And he got famous because he was spotted as being all around and a newspaper article uh, wrote about him and then he got fame that way. So the fame has always been about getting your name out. But in that time, what you would do is you would have, you would write your graffiti, take a picture of it, put it in a black book, or you would write your kind of tag in a black book and you sit in like a subway station and show your black book to all your other friends or people who were writing graffiti. And your fame became watching the trains, talking to people. That's how your name got out there. Now, you don't need to do that. You just have to take one picture of a piece of graffiti and it goes on the internet and it explodes and the thousands of people can, you can like it and suddenly you become famous that way. So it's, it's a very different, it's, it's not that dissimilar from the earlier days. It's just the speed, like everything uh, you know, on the internet can happen so much more quickly yeah word of mouth is crazy these days mm -hmm. and we can consider it like social media it's not technically the physical biological word of mouth it's becoming more of the artificial uh, mechanical mouth that ourselves building up just to spread that even faster you know absolutely there's a there's an interesting book called insta fame and it it, it really is this interesting idea of even when people are writing graffiti, they're writing it in a way that looks best on Instagram. So the Instagram is actually influencing the material writing of the graffiti itself. And it's a fascinating kind of topic, I think. Yeah. 
definitely. So yeah, it's bring down to the next questions that we have right now. It's when you think of like, let's say the four core elements of hip hop, uh, regardless of uh, knowledge as well, uh, recently been added um, amongst common sense. Uh, we're talking about graffiti as a very vocational, professional oriented, where it's less likely to be globalized and commercialized compares to the other three elements, which highly connected just via music, for example, and it's trans uh, transcends and transmitted quite quicker than graffiti, arguably. So what are your takes on this kind of like separation and as well as now we have the concern or the questions whether or not graffiti should be included within hip hop culture anymore? It's an, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I'm not an expert in hip hop particularly, so I'm not going to say how it fits or doesn't fit because it, it would be outside of my kind of realm of expertise. But I will say this. First of all, the question I think is even more of a basic question. It is how do you define graffiti? So if you're defining graffiti in kind of an old school bombing sort of way, so this is the guy or girl, uh, woman who hits the name over and over and over again on public property. It's illegal. It is not commercialized in any way. It's just writing my name over and over and over again. I think that does resist a certain type of commercialization. And there's a more connection to the earlier stages of graffiti. But if you're also defining graffiti as what Banksy does, then Banksy is all about the commercialization of the art form itself and selling it for millions of dollars. So really one of the first things we got to do is how are we kind of defining graffiti in that way? But I want to push that even more and push your question a little bit more. Yep. It does, while it does resist some commercialization, the old school graffiti style lettering, that has always been commercialized as well, almost as soon as it first started hitting the walls. I mean, think about the album covers that have the graffiti lettering on the covers themselves. That is being bought and sold in a certain way. It's, it's a way that someone is getting paid for their art. Whether it was in kind of uh, 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 taking from the streets, taking pictures of, and, or, uh, or people who were writing on the streets all of a sudden are doing canvases and being in museums and things like that, selling their art as well. Every time someone has a t-shirt that has a lettering on it or the caps with the lettering on it, it is it, still there. So the point is, it's not necessarily graffiti or intentions. It's capitalism, right? Capitalism yes. will always take anything and try to sell it. And graffiti is no different from anything else. And sometimes it resists it, but it also also gets subsumed at some point in another way. Definitely, definitely. It's the core center of your research as well as your presentation as well, to see the, the way graffiti move from kind of like the voices from the marginalized to the voices of the not marginal at all, the capitalists and how it's profiting and monetize, um, monetizing from that, which is. So yeah, I mean, I've, another example is like, I was talking to someone who's really, really trying to use graffiti in order to kind of help his neighborhood, right? And kind of yeah. use it. And he, the intentions are good. But as I push him and talk to him about how this can also lead to gentrification, he got really defensive and he's like, it's not my fault, it's capitalism's fault. And there is that kind of feel of like, you can't avoid that kind of, yeah, it, I mean, it's a huge topic in terms of authenticity and things like that, but capitalism always tries to take anything and sell it to a larger market. Definitely, and if you guys wanted to know more about that story, you guys can donate to the book because that is the part that I translated. Yeah, so the link and the QR code will be sure to be delivered to you somewhere in the video or yes. in the description. So Please somewhere up remember. here. <laughs> yeah, and actually that is, that's very fascinating because what I was looking like the what I've learned from that question and from that answer is we have a lot of gray areas in which yes. what we are trying to do. Yeah, and 
actually it depends on the context and the situation as well as your own perspectives on whether you're doing the right or the wrong thing so that is another topic for another day so let's <laughs> move on to our another question because the we are here in vietnam and i think that other people in other countries are also very intrigued in this question as well because do you we we would like to ask dr john lennon is what we would like to ask is do you feel like graffiti is going to be suitable or applicable in every country because there are different themes different cultures as well as different points of views and how we were raised and how a country is created as well as operated so uh, of course there there will not be same graffitis everywhere there will be different ways of implementing them ever in every single country so do you feel that it is suitable for graffiti to be integrated into different cultures and countries? it's a great question i i, I want to make sure that this is clear um that in my work is that I never want to say that the graffiti in one culture or what it means in one culture means the same thing in a different culture. That is absolutely not what I, I'm adamant against that. Um, and, in fact, and that's one of the reasons why when I write about different areas, I try to, I, I go to those areas, I, I, I walk the streets, I talk to the artists, I talk to the pol politicians, I talk to the entrepreneurs, because I think it is important. Everyone is a specific example. Let me, get, let me give a perfect example. So I was in Beirut, walking through uh, Beirut with uh, a person I knew who was from the scene, right? And I saw this... Um, Oh, I saw on a wall, it was an image of a car that was bombed out. And so I immediately said, oh, so this is about the recent conflict and the wars in Lebanon. And my guy said, no, that's just a symbol to show that this is where people are going to buy drugs. So if I would have, with my kind of white uh, um, U.S. mentality, wrote about that and said, oh, this is all about, you know, uh, bombings and, and kind of political situation, I would have been completely wrong. So part of it, I use that as an example because I need to, sh I need to understand it by talking to people and doing this. But despite that, there is never going to be a complete connection between or a, a, um, a photocopy of one scene in another scene. Everyone is materially connected. And that's my whole thing. It's the materiality. My whole thing. But I will say this, can we learn things by examining the different types of scenes that are growing and can we learn from those things? And that I do think it is true. So to answer your question, um, New York City graffiti in 1970s were really popular. They were then put into museums, academics wrote about them. And what happened was Graffiti festivals started all around the world in which they would invite those kind of early practitioners to, let's say, Germany, for example. And they would go in Ger to Germany and they would draw in a museum and they would put their art in a museum. But while they were officially there for that reason, then they would meet up with kids who are interested in graffiti in Germany or, or uh, other places that they were brought and they would go bombing at night. And so what they would do is kind of help kids who were just interested sort of about this community and they would learn, oh, I can go out every night and I can hit it. And suddenly in Germany, there was a huge graffiti scene. It still is present in, uh, to this day. That kind of, then, you know, that, that German kid goes to Sweden, for example, or goes to another country and he meets up with kids and he starts doing graffiti. And so therefore there's this like kind of international scene that was happening and that exploded obviously with the internet as well. So when I was in, um, I was in Cairo, um, I met up with a, a, a guy who was a graffiti writer who brought me to his kind of working class neighborhood way out in the in the city uh and what i was able to see is he was using this kind of lettering in the back of apartment buildings and doing graffiti and his neighbors supported him because they were like what is this uh, we don't get this so all of a sudden kind of he was interested in 
1970s graffiti, but he's really kind of putting forth this new kind of movement. So I'm answering it a little long, so let me just uh, shut up and say this, Afa, uh, is that I do not think you can replicate graffiti scenes, but you can be influenced by each other. And those influences are internationally based and it's really fascinating to me. All right, thank you for your questions. That is actually very informative. No, we uh, we cannot control what we've been influenced by, and right. yeah, the influence is everywhere, and it it is just I think a matter of time whether we we find like a perfect way to incorporate graffiti into different culture. Yeah, and I think the way we wanted to f push it further is how interconnected we are at living within the current society because I do know that there's a lot of international uh, graffiti artists would go bombing in Vietnam throughout those under hidden uh, networks and it's similar to how DJs got connected uh, which is also part of my uh, next upcoming research project on that it's that the, both the residential we have like residential locals and then we have the residential expatriates connecting these stuff together with the international uh, well, let's say like nomadic um, uh, artists who are traveling around the globe as within their uh, living, st uh, living style, lifestyle. It's creating more complex networks of artists uh, and the way we influence each other and the message that we exchange throughout these communications should be uh, understood or how we can say broadened within the our understanding of graffiti is not more likely localized and being framed within a specific geopolitical boundaries anymore. It's more likely borderless. And the way we go and uh, we're traveling within those uh, nation, even either in the state of mind or physically, would be fascinating and would help us to understand the war. I would hopefully to better understand us as humans living under societies. Yeah, it's it's absolutely that is that is true. And uh, I remember talking to one graffiti writer, and he's like, I could go to any city in this country, uh, in this world, and within a few minutes, I could meet up with other graffiti writers because I would just, you know, write on my Instagram and say, Hey, I'm in this city. Where should I go? And people would just come and help him. He could sleep on a couch of somebody. He could do something. So there is this kind of very welcoming. Uh, community that is being described to me that is international. So you're right, there is this rubbing together of different opinions, different cultures, different people um, that is actually through the graffiti itself. Yeah, so there is actually like a very interconnected relationships between a lot of uh, different graffiti artists with each other, but we, we just don't see it on the surface. And then, yeah, actually, that will be a very fascinating story when we take a deep dive into as well we're doing more observation in the future so thank you for dr john lennon and for the last question uh, this has come from a uh, a lot of different perspectives because uh in we here in vietnam the rapping scenes as well as the hip-hop culture currently is being expanding to mass media as well as a lot of more new newcomers is coming and joining us but there is the lights the lights are usually seems to be shed upon rappers, shed upon other elements of hip hop a little bit more than the graffiti artists. So, well, let's say that there are two different eras, the before the 2000s and after the 2000s. So, what do you, uh, what is your opinion on what, uh, where is the status, the position, the status of a graffiti artist in comparison? to the to a rapper to a group to a break dancer or to a dj, DJ. Uh, into you know when you talk about djs you're talking about uh rapping that is about communal right we're bringing people together it's a party it's a group together they're dancing they're enjoying themselves they're they, they're all coming to one area to listen to someone play music to dance to rap to do all this great stuff and it's a community-based thing graffiti is individual right you are part of a crew you might be bombing together but you're writing your own name and then somebody might help you with some larger things but it is really this almost individual writing on a wall 
And so I think that's a big difference between the two. One is a lot more the action itself is a communal action where it's taking place together. Graffiti writers are, you know, solitary. It's two o'clock in the morning. It's raining out. They're hitting the walls by themselves or with a friend and they're just going around unmanned see, you know, streets all that. So I think that's a big difference between that. So that's where, you know, it is a very different part of the scene itself. In the culture. That this is a very new perspective because yeah, we we are what we were wide open by this kind yeah. of situation because I I think that not not only in Vietnam but there will be a lot of these kinds of question regarding in the US and other countries as well because yeah. rappers uh, now nowadays they are they are pop stars now so yes yeah. <laughs> they're the popular rap, they are the rap popular. is the new pop basically yeah. so but I don't think uh, so a lot of comparison is going to be kind of vague I suppose. Okay. I'm like fascinated by. I would love someday in the future to be able to come to Vietnam because I would love to see the scene. I would love to be part of this. So Tian, when your book makes millions and millions of dollars, then you can bring me out and we can we can look at the scene together. How about that? Yeah, sure. And what what well, happily I, I would happily like to bring you around some of my favorite graffiti spaces, which is obviously I cannot say it online for the audience. Let's keep that our own secrets. <laughs> they were not doing it, not right now. <laughs> sure, not sure. Right now. <laughs> All right. So thank thank you so much to my Dr. John Lennon for taking your time here today and spending the, your valuable time with us. If you're here in Vietnam, we would very much want to invite you to have a dinner with us right now. But that will be virtually uh, physically impossible right now. So thank you so much for your time, time as well as thank you so much for the audience to stick around until this day until this time of the um, of the presentation of the webinars and of course to say thank you i would like to say gratitude and a thank, big thank you to all of the people who are watching the edited video as well yeah. you are you guys are very amazing we hope that this webinars as well as different parts of in the of the in the cultures project is going to be informative as well as going to give you much more a wider perspectives regarding the hip hop culture in general and for graffiti with Dr. John Lennon in specific. So uh, uh, Dr. John Lennon, do you have any last words for all of our spectators? Uh, don't, the only last thing I'll say is uh, it was on, or maybe you could put on the um, web too, is my email address. If people have specific yeah. questions or anything like that, I'm happy, or in my Instagram too. If people want to like ask me questions, I'm happy to continue the dialogue uh, if you if you want to. But thank you, Pa thank you. and Tian. I really appreciate this, and great good luck with the book. I can't wait to have it in my hands. Great, thank you for uh, so much, Professor Le uh, John Lennon. And, and yes, um, we'll really hope that you guys can continue contributing and continue uh, supporting us with the publishing project and also in the Culture Podcast. We we'll really hope that this kind of, kind of like new pioneering platforms will also going to help the Vietnamese audiences getting engaged more with the academic side, the scholarship side of hip hop studies. And we'll very gladly and we'll really hope that to host uh, Professor John Lennon uh, in person one day uh, in Vietnam. And let's see how the Vietnamese audience would interact with that. that so for now, yeah, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys in the next episodes of in the uh, in the culture podcast. Yeah, this worldwide edition is going to be come back very soon. So stay tuned and we are Viet Hip Hop and that is Dr. This is also with Dr. John Lennon. Peace. See you Bye later. Guys. See you later. later. In the culture.